So the next talk, talk we're going to, we've got five separate talks in the next um, session. Um, the next talk is um, really a carryover from what we were just talking about. It's lessons from COVID-19 that will inform the, uh, the future of the ACT network. And Sean, everybody knows Sean, uh, Jeff Plan is the director of the ITV2 core development. Um, we'll, we'll run through this and... Um, okay, so I uh, am going to... Um... Sean and I are going to talk about some stuff that could potentially be a future pipeline for research in the ACT network. And I love how all these things are building off of each other. This is uh, this builds on some things that were learned from 4C. This uh, builds on some things Russ talked about in Pokorna. This is other things that we've been working on or are currently working on in the ACT network. And I think it's some, re some really interesting ideas. So there was just a talk on ACT and how amazing ACT is, but I wanted to put a slide at the beginning that highlights a couple of things that Sean and I think are really important. Um, I think for me, the most important thing that ACT has is the ontology. It has, I think, 10 million elements uh, curated uh, meticulously by people at Pittsburgh um, with all possible things that you might find in an ACT data set. And that has been mapped by the many, many institutions that are in ACT so that you can access their data. And this has enabled um, the data to be accessible and by analytics, uh, both in ACT, but also in 4C. Um, I talked to some, some other, another group that wants to collaborate with uh, I2B2 sites and I suggested the ACT ontology and the mapped site data is a really powerful way to do that. So I think that is a huge contribution. And then in some ways, even a, a bigger contribution is the query tool, but I, I doing that second because a lot of people know about that. You can run a live query to find cohorts and do detailed kind of high level analytics to find patients um, online and get real time results. And most people, most people who are attending this know that already, but it's a really important way to find sites with adequate data. So what's the future? Well, no one knows what the future is, but here are some ideas and here's a pipeline that is inspired by things that we've learned from other places. Um, you could start with taking the data after you've got it in the ACT ontology and you could do quality on it. I'm gonna talk a bit about a quality project we're currently doing in ACT. Um, then you can uh, create derived facts like Sean talked about in the ACT uh, session just previously and we'll talk about more. Uh, then you can you have these reusable local analytics that allow you to uh, do analysis um, without writing local code. But then you can do your local validation and you can look to see if the data that popped out of your local analytics really matches what you intended it to say, like uh, the ICU example that was just being talked about. Are you really getting patients that match what you're looking for? And then you can pool all of those results and in a collaborative way, using shared tools like Google Docs and GitHub, you can put everything together into a publication that is transparently written and transparently developed. So I'm gonna talk about quality and then I'll hand it over to Sean to talk about a couple of additional sections. So this is a project that I've been involved in for a long time in different networks and we're taking it a step further than before in ACT. So I2B2 has this ability to count the number of patients with every item in the ontology. And like I just said, that's like seven to 10 million things in the ACT ontology. So you, you get these very granular counts of things. So you can see that in this data set, and these are obfuscated numbers, by the way, but plus or minus 10, 45,000 patients in this data set are on medications. And, um, but then just 4,900 are on angiotensin II inhibitors. So you can kind of drill in and see where there are holes in your data. So again, this isn't research yet. This is just kind of what can you learn about where your data has problems. Um, so uh, so what we're doing is we're distributing a script to sites. Um, and we, we did this in, uh, in the Arch Network back when I was involved in that. And we've much improved those scripts and are distributing it to sites in the ACT test network that will count the total number of patients for every item in their ontology. The sites can easily export a report table that the script generates. And um, we can put all those into an aggregated repository and then start to do uh, analytics and data browsing on that. So this is a screenshot from a data explorer that I have an early alpha version of that shows you a different distribution of uh, patients between Mass General Brigham and Pitt. And um, this is uh, 
this is real but obfuscated data. So you can see like there are more patients at Mass General Brigham with pneumonia than um, at Pitt. And this is notably, this is not a research query. This is not COVID patients with pneumonia. This is patients with pneumonia. So well, all we're looking for in this, at this stage is, is there a problem with the data? Does the data match what we might expect? Another important thing is every time you run this script, you get a new data point. So every time you do an ETL, you can rerun the script, and then the script gives you a new data point. This, this highlights the importance of frequent refreshes. So what you would expect as you ETL and then refresh the counts is you'd expect more data over time because patients are getting better, but the data on the patients that were sick is not going away or it shouldn't go away. So you can see that over time, the number of negative lab tests uh, on from, uh, this is from the COVID ontology, so these are COVID lab tests, uh, are going up quite dramatically. And thankfully, the number of positive lab tests is going up, but much more slowly. Um, and then I've, I've been told that demos are much more impressive than screenshots. So I put in just this little 10 second thing. This is a very early alpha and I find it kind of ugly, but I, I, this is the best I could do on short order. You can browse the ontology at any level of granularity and you can look at how the different counts and uh, trends over time match up. So you can drill all the way into the COVID, this is drilling into the COVID ontology, you can see um, negative positive lab tests, and then you can drill into like specific loint codes. And you can see that at Mass General Brigham, almost every lab code is 94309-2, which, um, which is a lab code I know by heart by now. Uh, then you can start to you know, use the same data to develop descriptive reports to kind of compare sites. You can also do analytics to find what's missing. So this is just a quick uh, SQL script I wrote to find what's missing between the data sets that we got. And this is you know, just Pittsburgh and Mass General Brigham. Brigham. I want to highlight that it actually found something. Um, unnamed site A uh, <laughs> sent me data by mistake without COVID lab tests, um, just a glitch on, on their side. And it, it did actually flag that. So, so it's an example that we can actually see some things. Um, and then this is, this is uh, only two sites, right? But you can look at outliers across sites. And that's kind of an exciting concept. If, you, if one site has way fewer diabetics than other sites, then perhaps there's a problem with that site's data, or perhaps not, perhaps it's a different population, but it's something you wanna look into. This is just two sites, so I don't know what's normal. I don't know if 30% of patients on antibiotics or 50% of patients on antibiotics is normal, but there's a difference, and that might be something worth looking at. And as you get more sites, the, uh, the uh, obviousness of what you should look at becomes clearer. Um, and then you can also look at the trends across time. And as I was saying earlier, you want the, you want the data to get bigger over time. So in the top line, you see something is probably wrong. There, this is probably poor quality because you see the total number of patients with this fact decreasing over time. And you see that in the bottom row as well. And in the middle, you see it increasing gradually over time, which is what you might expect. So uh, that's, that's in process. And that's, that's kind of the first step we're thinking in this in this pipeline for research. And now uh, I'll keep the slides up, but I'll let Sean take over. So you, you tell me when to switch slides, Sean. I, I will, thank you very much. Um, and nice, nice job. So um, the second part of the process, so the process, this is, this is a process of how to do research in your local repositories, which is coordinated essentially through something like ACT or 4CE. And it's kind of very similar if you think of it, except for the initial, um, uh, feasibility study that ACT can do just to see if there's enough patients in your repository to be worth a look, right? So then you do the quality assessment to see if, there, if your data is, is, is good, good enough quality. And then you start to like do these derived facts. Next, next uh, slide. So facts are kind of the basis of I2B2 and it's all about what the patient has been observed on the patient. And oftentimes what we do is we take a, a set of different kinds of facts and we put it in a folder to group them together. So all the different kinds of diabetes get grouped into a folder. You also can have facts that are the, the result of queries. And so a lot of times we generate patient sets from queries and those are kind of a new set of facts if you wanna think of it that way. And then we can also have derived facts and those derived facts are kind of computed facts and it gets all the way from you know, some basic computation on the text like we showed with that, um, with, with, with the COVID tests to a computed phenotype. Um, next slide. Next slide, Jeff. Great. 
And you actually have different levels of facts. So you have level one facts, which is really just reclassifying facts that you have observed on the patient into something that might be named a little bit differently or grouped a little bit differently. And then you have level two facts, which really can be transformed, but have some kind of embodiment of time in them, such that a level two fact is often based around an index date or is a ramp of time where somebody might be getting worse and it states that actually in the fact. Next quest, quest, next slide. So here's a, a typical level one fact where you take something and you're simply kind of transforming uh, something complicated into a simpler fact, but it's still a fact that's observed over a period of time. Next slide. Making something like the COVID positive test into a single fact. Next slide. And then uh, when you take those facts, you can make them into what we call level two facts, which are kind of analytic facts. Next slide. And so there we can start to do analysis. Next slide. Let me show this already. So. And, and the interest is in making tables, right, where you have one row per patient. And so what here you have different codes, right, which might represent different facts about patients, which are, you just have one per patient. Next slide. And so what you're doing usually is you're aggregating a whole bunch of time-dependent facts into some kind of aggregate value. Next slide. And you can do this automatically at times. Like you can say, okay, take all the diabetes facts on a patient and just give me the first date, which you're going to kind of say is maybe the, when the patient got diabetes with lots of caviates in it. It's a very simple kind of level two fact. Next slide. And you can see that that makes a date right? So that's the date when they first got diabetes. Now it turns out that dates like this can be, are called index dates. They're like the key date, like in our COVID uh, uh, analysis, it was the date that they were tested positive for COVID or tested negative for COVID. That's the index. Everything kind of revolves around that. So all your new level two facts are going to take that date into consideration and say, what was their lab value after that? Or what was, their, what was their normal lab values before that? And so making these level two facts is a way that you can put analytic data in your fact tables, which can be reused over and over. Next slide. And the, that is the primary fodder of what we use in our analytic script. So we go through this process of kind of renaming and grouping so that we know what our level one facts are. Then we make them a, 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 a into level two facts, which are these one fact per patient that we can use in machine learning scripts um, because they have time embodied in them. And that's very important. Um, next slide. Next slide, Jeff. There you go. Now it's, it's back to Jeff. Yeah. Okay. So I, uh, we only have like nine minutes left, so I'll try to keep this, this on the short side, but it actually has some results, which is kind of fun. So once you have your data from on the local side, you, you want to check it to see if it actually matches what you expect it to mean. So this example uses a four C's definition of severity, which is a very, a very nice way of finding a proxy for patients that had a bad hospital course. I found that a lot of sites don't have easy access or accurate access to ICU uh, admission data and um, not always death data either. So they tried to find uh, some proxies that would kind of indicate a patient who had a rough time. Not necessarily ICU, not necessarily death, but a rough time. And uh, I'll, I'll let you read through these, but not being an intensivist, I, I don't know that I can comment on it as well as. Uh, as well as others. Uh, so the severity measure was developed to capture patients who had a difficult hospital course. So we started validating it. And the nice thing about these local analytics is that when you, for sites that have these codes, you can share very similar scripts and, uh, and compute these things. So this is a comparison, this is a first level comparison, comparing it to the other data. So comparing severity to ICU or death during that hospitalization. And as you can see, um, site A, is, I'll, I'll give it away as us, uh, Site A is, shows that it's very uh, specific. So it's the people who are flagged severe are severe, but it's not super sensitive. There are other people out there who have a, a rough time. 
um, who end up in the ICU or die. And that, that was actually confirmed, the same, kind of almost the same results uh, in terms of sensitivity and specificity showed up at site B. And then site C actually had kind of the opposite result where it was very sensitive and not very specific. And so that's an important reason to do this at multiple sites to kind of see the differences between sites. And maybe, uh, maybe there's something going on there and we can find that out with some, um, some of the stuff in, in the next step. The next step that we've taken is to actually look at the chart. So the chart uh, allows, allows you to see what actually happened to the patient, not just what's in the coded data. Now that requires a human being to read the chart and code the chart into some kind of analyzable document and that does require time. But we took a random subset of 100 and um, just looked at the number of patients who were flagged severe or not severe and had IC or death or neither and then compared that to chart review. So top is coded data, bottom is chart review. And you can see it actually looks pretty similar. The, the one major difference is that our data were flagging a bunch of people who were in the, as being in the ICU, who according to a chart review were not in the ICU. So that's kind of the opposite of, what, of the kind of systemic problem that was talked about earlier, but uh, it seems to be the case that our data is flagging people that shouldn't be flagged as ICU. Uh, but actually that improves the, uh, the, the specificity, or I'm sorry, the sensitivity at our, at our site. So it went up a little bit with the, um, with the chart reviewed data. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can explore subsets of these codes with your, with your analytics, right? So uh, Hussein Asturi, who's one of our faculty, um, does a lot of this kind of uh, data, data mining to find, uh, to find patterns in codes. And uh, so he, he ran his algorithm, which is in this case a uh, generalized linear model. Um, so it's kind of a regression uh, to find what the high uh, and most important coefficients are um, in the in the model based on the codes that were chosen for severity. So which of the severe codes actually are most important in predicting that a patient had ICU or death? And it turns out that it's a lot of PCO2 tests because everyone going to the ICO2 is getting a blood gas. Um, and so you see a bunch of different PCO2 tests here because they're at different institutions so they have different codes, but highly, highly uh, focused on, uh, on blood gas tests. Um, so just just to be clear, they're not predicting; they're correlated with. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks, Sean. Um, though, though, I suppose I, it's down in the weeds, but I think if you took all the coefficients in this model, you it, it is a predictive model. But we're not trying to say it's predicting anything; it's just high high correlations. Um, and taking different subsets then lets you plot the sensitivity versus specificity and create an ROC curve. So you can see different sets of subsets of codes create a different, different points on the sensitivity specificity ROC curve. And so this is about where the point of any one code shows up with the specificity of about 0.45 and sensitivity 0.95. So that's, that's the results I showed earlier on an ROC curve. Um, so takeaways. Chart review is really important to validate phenotypes, and these things can be run at multiple sites. And then we move on to pooling and publishing our results. Sean, do you want to? Why don't you start on this, sure. this slide, and then I'll I'll hop in for a second. No, that'd be yeah, that'd be great. And thanks. Um, so the idea is, you know, you want to show people that you have an open process, and a lot of what I think you know ends up being controversial is like you know who's contributing to papers and, you know, are, is my name going to get on a paper? I'm doing a lot of work here, right? We're doing a lot of work locally on getting these sets all taken care of and, you know, doing chart review and all that. So I think then the, the contribution to the paper could be in some kind of open kind of Google Doc that actually kind of takes shape in front of you and you can mold and everybody has a fair chance at. And this group science, I think, is probably the most important, keyest thing in making this kind of thing actually work because everybody needs to understand their stake in it and understand you know where they're how they how they are contributing i mean there were some amazing contributions made during this crisis and i just think you know making sure that people understand their importance is is is, is just critical next slide uh, 
The other thing that we need to do is when we pool things together is we need to pay attention to small cell sizes. So a lot of times it ends up that we have small numbers of patients. And so we, there's a method being developed by the Medco um, organization, Jean Pierre and uh, Jean Louis are doing this with homomorphic encryption. And there's another method with secure multi-party -part computation with uh, Zer uh, Bastaveros and Lawrence Stunt. And so exploring those, I think, are going to be very important so we can pull together small cell sizes. Next slide. Just a one minute time check, uh, Sean. Thank you very much. Um, so just kind of reiterating, I mean, what we're looking here at is a new method, right? So it's a method where we can go from quality um, uh, checks, then to deriving facts to make sure we're deriving facts on quality data. Then we do local analytics on those derived facts, the, the, those the facts that are now relevant. Uh, then we do the validation that, 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 that Jeff described uh, to make sure that we've actually, you know, correlated with reality, uh, which is important to, 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 with EHR data. And then we pull the results and then we do the publication. Next slide. Great. So thank you. Thank you. Yep, I think that's it. We finished on time.